right guys um well here we are again doing a video instead of class so thanks again for being flexible um hopefully after um i get this issue taken care of we'll have normal class for the rest of the semester so today we are learning um about our new unit romanticism and um, we're going to be studying washington irving so the quote i have here for romanticism is a quote by emerson Trust thyself, every heart vibrates to that iron string. So we'll talk more about Emerson when I introduce the transcendentalists, but that's just a really good quote to go with them, um, some of the big ideas of romantic literature. Um, so let's give you some historical context. The dates for Romanticism are 1820 to 1865. 1820 is significant because that is the publication date of Washington Irving's sketchbook. So his first major publication, collection of short stories, was published in 1820. Um, and it was such an important work of literature, um, we consider that publication as marking the beginning of Romanticism. And then 1865 is the end of the Civil War, and hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Um, it will, the more we talk about romanticism, about how um, we have been, the romantics were very idealistic and very optimistic, and so the Civil War kind of shut that down, um, and then we move into realism, which you have to take American Lit too to get there. All right, a um, couple things going on. The Monroe Doctrine was basically um, a government establishment, um, a government doctrine establishing that um, no other countries were allowed to colonize um, in the continental United States. So basically saying, you know, what's out west is our territory and we don't want British colonies or French colonies or Spanish colonies. It was really just kind of putting, particularly with westward expansion, um, that was a claim of ownership there from our government. So there was a lot of movement out west during this time period. Um, I'm sure you've heard of the Lewis and Clark expedition. That happened a little earlier. They were, it was like 1805 or something that Lewis and Clark, um, but they really laid the groundwork for showing what a wonderful, beautiful country was um, out west and opening the door for more people to move out there. So you kind of think um, Little House on the Prairie, kind of Stoga Wagons type thing. Um, we also have during this time period what was called uh, another um, move of the government called the Indian Removal Act, which is just what it sounds like. Um, the president, I think it was President Jackson, authorized um, the removal of Indians and taking over their territory. And then we have what is often referred to as the Trail of Tears, um, the different Indian tribes being forced out of their native lands, which, of course, is, is very sad. Um, some other things we have going on, of course, slavery is in full force. So we have the establishment of the Underground Railroad. In this unit, we are going to read Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, by Harriet Beecher Stowe. We are going to read Frederick Douglass, and so we will um, learn more about what all that meant um, as far as slaves trying to escape the South and make their way North, all that leading up to the Civil War. Um, the California Gold Rush was another big thing going on. Um, with the movement out West, a lot of people thought there was wealth to be had, particularly in California, and so that was a big draw. And then, again, just so you have this date, 1861 was the beginning of the Civil War, which lasted four years, ending in 1865. So, literary characteristics. First and foremost, the Romantics were idealists. And, like, when you think about that word romantic, don't think, like, Valentine's Day, roses are red, you know... I like you, romantic. This was more romantic in the sense of being idealistic and sentimental and thinking the best of all possible worlds. Like if you're a romantic, then you are a believer in happy endings. Um, 
you know, you see the glasses half full, you're not, you're not a pessimist. Which that makes sense, guys, right? Like, we just won the Revolutionary War in this time period. There's so many resources to be had in the United States, and the possibilities just seem endless. And so the authors of this time period really embraced that concept of, of um, infinite possibilities. Um, individualism was a big thing um, up to this point. And really, Franklin kind of laid the way for that, right, um, with his story of the self-made man. So we see more of an emphasis on what does it mean to be an individual person, not just the people group, right? Like not the pilgrims um, or the Puritans or whatever, but um, what does it mean to celebrate individuality? And we'll get to that even more with the transcendentalists. The Romantics love to write about nature, which I'm sure um, if you read Irving, um, you got that because there's all these really long descriptions of the Catskill Mountains and Sleepy Hollow and um, nature is a big deal. And again, um, when we read Thoreau, who lived out, you know, Walden Pond and nature was a big deal to him. Um, imagination is another big one, which I hope you saw that <laughs> with Irving's stories. Rip Van Winkle, huge element of imagination there. Um, the supernatural. In fact, you could put imagination slash the supernatural here because we see that in both of these stories and both Rip Van Winkle and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow are quintessential romantic stories. Symbolism is another big thing. Um, the romantics like to be like they're really heavy on the symbolism, particularly when we read The Scarlet Letter. You know, everything is symbolic in The Scarlet Letter. The A stands for something. Pearl is symbolic and, you know, all the names mean are symbolic of something. Um, another big um, romantic novel is Moby Dick and the whale is symbolic of, you know, like five different ideas. So symbolism was big. Social reform was another big idea. Um, obviously slavery was a huge issue in the romantic time period. So there was a lot of efforts to reform that. How can we um, move towards greater equality? How can we move towards greater justice when it comes to slavery? Um, and even social reform as far as like how impoverished people were treated, um, social reform towards women's rights and things like that. And then finally, I'm just going to have you write down transcendentalism because it's a part of romanticism, but I'm actually going to introduce that separately. What transcendentalism is um, in after your, you have another test in a few weeks, and so then after that test, we'll jump into the transcendentalists because they really deserve their own um, unit, so to speak. But they were, they were considered, just let me just clarify, the transcendentalists were kind of a branch of romantics. Does that make sense? So transcendentalism falls under the umbrella of romanticism. All right, so let's move on to Washington Irving. Sorry that picture is so pixelated. I couldn't find a better quality one. Um, I need to spend more time looking. So he lived from 1783 to 1859. And um, he was born in New York City to a middle class family. He was a first generation um, American. Both his parents were immigrants. And um, so he grew up in a family of, of hardworking people. And they did pretty well for themselves. If you read his bio, um, when he was a young man, um, in his late teens, he was kind of sickly. He showed signs of tuberculosis. And so his brothers actually sent him to Europe for two years. So they had the means to pay for him to go um, somewhere where he could get better care and, you know, be in a place that was, was better suited for his health. Um, so he did come back and studied law, and so, you know, he was on his way to being a lawyer and um, was engaged to a young woman who died, and after her death, she died from a sudden illness. Um, he kind of shied away from the law and, you know, kind of went on this new, new bent. 
So along with his writing, he was very well traveled. He worked for the United States government in a couple different capacities. Um, he was the secretary to the American legation in London, which basically means he was a diplomat of sorts, um, ambassador slash diplomat. He also was the minister to Spain for several years. So he spent years abroad working for the government. And all this time, he is gathering information. He is um, particularly European folk tales. A lot of his writings are sourced from these folk tales that he heard in Europe. And so when he finally came back, um, and he'd already been writing at this point, um, but he was the first, I say the first professional American author, he was the first person to make his living solely by writing. So he lived for years solely by his pen. That was the only thing that brought him money were his, um, his publications. And so that was something new and unusual. He never did get married. And a lot of people say you can see that in his stories, that he preferred the bachelor life. Like Rip Van Winkle, he didn't, um, you know, there was not a whole lot of love lost between him and his wife. And uh, so that's interesting. And um, he's also known as the father of the American short story. So as I'm sure you've gathered in this class, thus far we haven't really read any stories. We've read a lot of history. We've read sermons. We've read government documents and pamphlets and, you know, just some autobiographies, but here we finally have some fiction. And so um, he really established some different things that show up again and again in American literature, um, particularly with the legend of Sleepy Hollow, this idea of, of local color, of a story that's specific to like a town, right? Legends, myths specific to a certain area. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we're going to start with Rip Van Winkle, which I'm sure you've heard of this story before, if you haven't read it. And um, it's kind of a fun story, right? A couple things going on here, and um, basically the little preface about Diedrich Knickerbocker. He's a fictional narrator. All right, this isn't super important to your understanding of the story, but just to clarify, so Diedrich Knickerbocker was a made-up person who supposedly wrote down all this, you know, Dutch lore of the time period, and that's where we get these stories from. But he's not a real person. He's someone that Irving made up. All right, so let's talk about our main characters, Rip Van Winkle and Dame Van Winkle. So... We have, and there's a lot of humor in this story. I hope you saw the humor in it. Um, a lot of gender stereotypes going on here. So Riff Van Winkle is like the quintessential lazy, no good husband. And Dame Van Winkle, his wife, is like the naggy, annoying, loud, obnoxious wife. Like, do your chores, go to the grocery store, do this, do that. And he's like, oh, I'm tired. Oh, I, I have to go clip my toenails or, you know, whatever excuse he would make up. So let's look a little bit of this. Um, Look at the bottom of page 30. Oh, which, by the way, if you haven't gathered this yet, we are now in volume B of your book. So we're now, hopefully you bought two books at the beginning of the semester. So we've now moved on to the big one, volume B. And that's where we'll be for the remainder of the semester. All right, so page 30. At the very bottom of the page. All right, so describing Ruth Van Winkle. Last, last three lines there. I have observed that he was a simple, good-natured man. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor and an obedient, henpecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. For those men are most apt to be obsequious and conciliating abroad who are under the discipline of shrews at home. Their tempers, doubtless, are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation. And a certain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long-suffering." 
a termagant wife may, therefore, in some respects, that just means like an angry wife, um, be considered a tolerable blessing. And if so, Rip Van Winkle was thrice blessed. All right, so you can hear there his wife is like the author calls her a shrew, and he is called henpecked. So, um, <clears throat> he. It's interesting because as much as she is constantly annoyed by him, everybody else in the town loves him. And he actually is really helpful to other people, but he's not helpful at home. Like his own home is falling to pieces because he won't fix the fence or the gutters or the roof. But like when he's walking around the neighborhood, the village, he actually will stop and help someone do something. So kind of the irony there. Um, let's see. Look at page 32. I'll read you one more. One more quote about Rip and his wife. Top of page 32. First paragraph. Rip Van Winkle, however, was one of those happy mortals of foolish, well-oiled dispositions who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever can be got with the least thought or trouble, and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment. But his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night, her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Um, and so then it talks about how when she would, like, nag at him, he would just kind of shrug his shoulders, roll his eyes, you know, and then, um, then he would just leave the house. He would just go outside or go to the mountains. Um, so it's interesting, and I want you guys to see how these gender stereotypes are even, like, linger today. Think of every sitcom you've ever seen, right? Um, I don't know how many of you grew up watching um, the show Home Improvement with Tim Allen. Like, that is, that's Rip Van Winkle and Dan Van Winkle, right? Like, the woman is the organized, hardworking, you know, let's get stuff done. And the guy is just kind of a lazy bum, chilling out. But people like him, right? <coughs> okay, so those are our characters. Now let's talk about setting. Um, the main thing I want you to see about setting is the, the description of nature. That is one of the romantic elements of this story is that um, as we build towards the climax, Rip Van Winkle walks out of the valley and goes up the mountains. So on page 33, and this is one of those days where his wife has been yelling at him a lot, and so he decides to just leave. Um, about the middle of page 33, in a long ramble of the kind on a fine autumnal day, Rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the Catskill Mountains. He was after his favorite sport of squirrel shooting, and the still solitudes had echoed and re-echoed with reports of his gun. And then it goes on to describe, you know, just the beautiful nature, and the reflection of a purple cloud, and the sail of a lagging bark, and here and there, sleeping on its glassy bosom, you know, was the greenness of the mountains. And it's just this beautiful, long description of the Catskill Mountains. So what you want to write there is just this romantic description of nature. And that really sets the tone for the story. So as we all know, Rip Van Winkle, he's up in the mountains and he hears this dude, right, calling his name. And he eventually meets this weird little guy um, carrying a keg. And Rip Van Winkle helps him carry the keg to the party and he meets these other young, you know, these other little dudes who are bowling in the mountains. And here we have that supernatural element of the story. And so after he drinks whatever's in that keg, that liquor, he has a long sleep, right? And when he wakes up from this long sweet sleep, excuse me, how many years have passed? I always have to double check myself. 20 years. I almost said 40. 20 years have passed um, that he's been sleeping in the mountains, which, again, supernatural because we all know you can't sleep for 20 years. That's not realistic. But this is not a realistic story. It's a romantic story. All right. 
So, um, Rip has a supernatural experience, um, and he wakes up, and, you know, his gun is rusty, and his dog has disappeared, and his joints are really stiff. So, he goes down the mountain, right? And um, everyone kind of looks at him funny, and everything looks different, and his beard has grown a foot long. Um, but the main thing is, is his life better or worse after this long sleep? I would say better. What's the main thing that has changed that has given him an easier life? His wife died. And that's kind of sad to say, but it is true. Um, look at page 39. So he's real confused at first, right? Because he's like, long live King George. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're a Tory. Ah, this is America. Um, so he has to readjust to all the politics of the time. But look at page 39. So he actually meets... Um, <clears throat> his daughter, top of page 39, um, what is your name, my good woman, asked he, Judith Gardner, and your father's name? Ah, oh, poor man, his name was Rip Van Winkle. It's 20 years since he went away from home with his gun and never has been heard of since. His dog came home without him, but whether he shot himself or was carried away by the Indians, nobody can tell. I was then but a little girl. Rip had but one more question to ask. He put, he put it with a faltering voice. Where's your mother? Oh, she too had died, but a short time since. She broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a New England peddler. So his wife died in, in an angry fit. There was a drop, or, drop of comfort, at least, in this intelligence. The honest man could contain himself no longer. He caught his daughter and her child in his arms. I am your father, cried he. And so he tells this whole story. And um, he goes to live with his daughter who has enough, you know, she's married a man who has enough wealth to support Rip. And now Rip can just sit around and um, now it is acceptable for him to be lazy, right? Because when you're old, it's okay to just sit around and gossip and putter around town and all this stuff. So honestly, his long sleep in a lot of ways was a reward. <coughs> Something I want you to consider as we move from the Enlightenment to Romanticism is Rip anything like Benjamin Franklin's self-made man? No, he's the opposite. He didn't work hard. He wasn't industrious. Now, you could say he was frugal because it's not like he was spending money on stuff. But he definitely wasn't working on saving money. That's right. Um, he had no ambition. He just liked to lay around and be lazy and just be kind of chill. And so how far we've come in just a few short years... Um, as far as the, the main characters of the narratives we read. So, um, really, this story could be viewed as a tragedy or a comedy. Um, and really, the difference between a tragedy or, or a comedy, it does it end happily or does it end sadly? And I would say this ends pretty happily. As far as an overarching theme, um, I would say the biggest emphasis here is the idea of change. And a lot of people thinks a lot of people think that what Irving was getting at here was the rapid change happening in America, right? Like a man could go to sleep as one character in the town and wake up as a completely different character 20 years later. That's how quickly life was changing. Um, in fact, look at page 40. I'll read you one more quote here. All right. First full paragraph at the top of page 40. Rip now resumed his old walks and habits. He soon found many of his former cronies, though all rather the worse for the wear and tear of time, and preferred uh, making friends among the rising generation with whom he soon grew into great favor. Having nothing to do at home and being arrived at that happy age when a man can do nothing with impunity... He took his place once more on the bench at the end door and was reverenced as one of the patriarchs of the village and a chronicle of the old times before the war. So he becomes like this living history book and he's revered by the town um, because of the mythology associated with his character. So again, that whole idea of change and how quickly change happens and how one man can... Um, can be changed in such a short time. All right. Okay, so that's Rip Van Winkle. Um, and for your blog post, you guys are doing a blog post for Irving. 
you have two options. You can either write marriage advice to the Van Winkles, or you can give dating advice to Ichabod Crane. All right, so this is more of a creative type prompt. So have fun with it. Um, show me you read, show me you listened, that you are um, caught up on your homework, and that's the main thing I'm looking for. Um, okay, we're not going to do the terms here. I'll give y'all a handout of those. So let me jump to the legend of Sleepy Hollow. Which, let me just say up front, this is a long story. Irving has lots of words, and I get it. Um, in fact, if you listen to the audio version, like there's a couple audio versions you can find on YouTube or whatever. I mean, it takes more than an hour to listen to this story. So I get it. It's a long story. Um, something that may help you think through this story, I will post a link on Blackboard. There's actually like a Disney cartoon version of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow that is pretty close to the original story. So, um, you know, you could pause this right now and go watch that link if you want to. And um, I would probably have showed a clip or two in class. Um, but there you go, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Let's talk about this. So turn over to page, um, let's see, this starts on page 41. Yeah, Irving just has lots of words. All right, let me get to the right place in my notes here. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about the main character, Ichabod Crane, and what he's like. So if you read, you know Ichabod Crane, he is, um, he's a single dude. He is the village school teacher, and um, he's kind of odd. He's awkward. He's um, kind of funny looking. In fact, let's read a look a little bit. Look at page 43. <coughs> okay. All right, about halfway down the page, halfway through that paragraph in the middle, it says the cognomen, which means just means name, of Crane was not inappropriate inapplicable to this person. In other words, he kind of looked like a, a skinny bird, right? He was tall but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame hung, most loosely hung together. His, no his head was small and flat at the top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it might have been mistaken for a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck to tell which way the wind blew. And then talked about how he looks like a scarecrow on a windy day. And that's, like, if you watch the little cartoon clip, like, they, that's exactly how they portray him. He's, like, this really skinny, awkward fella with big nose and big ears. All right, so he's a school teacher, and he's mostly liked in the town. Um, and for the most part, we do like Ichabod Crane. You know, we feel kind of bad for him. Um, and we'll, we'll get into the big conflict surrounding his character. Let me read you a little bit more about him. Turn to page 45. So it talks about how, because he's the school teacher, um, in particular, the women see him as a character of importance because he is someone with education. Most of their husbands are farmers, and so he's he's revered. And instead of having a permanent home, he would actually um, spend a week or two in different people's houses. So that was part of his payment plan as being a teacher for the village. And so because of that, he was kind of knew all the gossip on everyone, which was another reason all the women liked him. So just a little something for you to think about. All right, let's read a little bit more. Middle page 45. Um, and this just tells us more about his personality. Middle of page 45. He was, in fact, an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity. His appetite for the marvelous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region. No tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow. It was often his delight after his school was dismissed of an afternoon to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover, bordering the little brook that whimpered past his schoolhouse, and there con over old Mather's direful tales. 
Um, so basically, he's very superstitious. He likes scary stories. And Sleepy Hollow is a place where there are, there's a lot of mythology and a lot of ghost stories, okay? And we know this from the very beginning of, of um, this story, and obviously the title, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and the Headless Horseman. And so Ichabod Crane just eats that stuff up. He believes it all. He's superstitious. Um, he likes to read the scary stories, and that's just part of his character. So the central conflict in this story is about a girl. So Ichabod Crane, um, you know, about 10 pages in the story, um, decides that he likes Katrina Von Tassel. Is it Von Tassel? Yeah, Van Tassel. Let me say it right here. All right. So page 48, bottom page 48. From the moment Ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight, the peace of his mind was at an end, and his only study was how to gain the affection of the peerless daughter of Van Tassel. In this enterprise, however, he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of knight errant of yore. Um, so basically, and if you read carefully, he likes Katrina. Like she's a pretty, he, she's a pretty young girl, but he mostly likes the wealth of her father, and he thinks if he can um, marry Katrina, then he will be well taken care of. And um, he's after that comfort of marrying into a wealthy family. Um, however, he is not the only one who likes Katrina Van Tassel. And um, a young man named, well, his nickname is Brom Bones. Um, the top of page 49, you can read about him. And Brom Van Brunt, the hero of the country round, which rung with his feats of strength and hardihood, he was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance, having a mingled air of fun and arrogance. From his Hercule Herculean frame and great powers of limb, he had received the nickname of Brom Bones, by which he was universally known. He was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship. All right, so we have the skinny, awkward school teacher, and then we have the very physical, athletic, um, cool guy, Brom Bones, and they're both after the same girl, okay? So this is like a really typical setup, right? So um, we move forward in the story, and the story moves forward to its climax, and here we really see the role of the supernatural and this idea of imagination, which is really prevalent in romantic stories. So, um, the Van Tassels are a party, okay, and um, everyone goes to the party, and Ichabod Crane thinks it's going to be, you know, this is going to be my chance to woo Katrina Van Tassel and dance with her, and, you know, I can propose, and she's going to love me. So they go to the party, and um, of course, who else is there but Brom Bones, right? So both guys are there, and they're both after K Katrina. And the party goes pretty well, you know, like, Ichabod feels pretty good about it. But towards the end of the party, all right, so turn over to page 55, the ghost stories start. And so as things wind down, all the older men in the room sit around and tell these ghost stories. So middle of page 55. But all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded. The neighborhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind. Local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered, long-settled retreats. All right, so this idea that because this is a long-established community, Sleepy Hollow's been there for a long time, all this myth um, has really thrived, and, you know, it's become very well-known. All right, towards the bottom of page 55, like the last four lines. The chief part of the stories, however, turned upon the favorite specter of Sleepy Hollow, the Headless Horseman, who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country, and it was said, tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard. So then they all start telling their stories of their encounters with the Headless, headless Horseman. And even um, Brom Bones, he tells, he's like, oh yeah, I saw him one time, and... um. 
you know, he kind of makes it like, oh, it was no big deal. Headless Horseman, ha, huh? I can ride better than him. And so um, look at page 56. And you can imagine that this affected Ichabod. So page 56, towards the bottom of the page, all these tales told in that drowsy undertone with which men talk in the dark, the countenances of the listeners only now and then receiving a casual gleam from the glare of the pipe sunk deep in the mind of Ichabod. All right, so he's just eating all this up, right? He's sitting there listening to all these ghost stories. So then here on page 56, 57, the author doesn't really tell us what happens, but all we know is that he talks to Katrina and he walks away sad, right? Like he goes to propose her or whatever, and then he comes away and he's crestfallen. So he has to go home and I guess he's been rejected, right, is the implication. Um, and so on the way home, he has his encounter with the Headless Horseman, right? And this part, the climax of the story goes on for like four pages, right? Like on and on and on. He first sees the Headless Horseman. And the Headless Horseman, you know, rides beside him. And he'll speed up and the, the Horseman speeds up. And he slows down and the Horseman slows down. So let's just read, like, the very end. Page 59. It all comes to a head here. Oh, that's a terrible pun. It comes to a head. And the Horseman throws his has no head. Ha. Um, okay. Bottom of page 59. Sorry about that. Okay. So here he thinks he's going to escape, right? So he's, he's trying to get to the bridge. I'm about eight lines up from the bottom. Just then he heard the black steed planting and blowing close behind him. He fancied he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs and old gunpowder, so that's Ichabod's horse, sprung upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side. And now Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish, according to the rule, in a flash of fire and brimstone. So that's what the stories say. Just then, he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He was tumbled headlong into the dust, and Gunpowder, the black steed, and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind. And so then it goes straight to the next morning. Um, they find the horse, no saddle. Um, just out eating grass, no Ichabod, and they find a shattered pumpkin. All right. So do you guys get the implication here? Who was actually the headless horseman trying to get rid of, making fun of Ichabod Crane? The implication is that it was Brom Bones, right? That he like pulled his jacket up over his head and was holding a pumpkin and threw it at Ichabod. And because of Ichabod's superstition, um, it freaked him out. Um, <coughs> I think this is just an interesting question as far as the detailed descriptions, how they affect you as the reader. The purpose is to draw you in and paint the picture and make it very real and vivid. But in some ways, do you feel like Irving goes overboard and it's almost so much that you feel like you're slogging through um, all these details? And that really just depends on the personality of the reader. It could go either way. And so um, no one ever hears from Ichabod again. Years later, um, they hear gossip that he's living in some neighboring town. You know, he has a different job now. Um, so he didn't completely disappear, but he definitely leaves Sleepy Hollow. Um, so here's an interesting question for you. In a story about two men chasing after a girl, is there any actual romance? Not really. In fact, um, Katrina is, is definitely objectified in the story. She's portrayed as a, a tasty morsel. And we all, Ichabod, that's another one of his weird quirks is that he eats a lot. He likes to eat. Um, skinny guy who's always eating. But anyway, just the idea that this is not a romantic story in the sense of like the notebook, right? This is a romantic story in the sense of these romantic elements, the supernatural, the imagination, um, the idea of um, Ichabod's superstition. Those are the huge romantic elements in this story. And even the descriptions of nature and Sleepy Hollow. 
are important romantic elements. All right, so hopefully that all makes sense to you, and hopefully you enjoy this. Kind of a nice change from all the political stuff we've been reading. We finally get to read some stories. I like Washington Irving. Um, like I said, don't forget about your blog post. That is due um, Tuesday night, midnight. Um, so let me know if you have any questions, and I am hoping to be in class on Thursday to give you your quiz.